and then he came to, and he decided he wasn't ever going to touch that again. <laughs> Nick, come on up. Let's talk about fire trees. All right. yeah. Thanks, Nicole. Um, real quick, though, before I get started with talking about fire trees, every single person, I came here not to make money. I came here to help and to teach and to network. That's what these things are about, yeah. is being around and meeting people that are making changes in their lives. You would not be here if you were not making changes in your life, positive changes. Um, one of my guiding principles is do good things. Let's not do perfect things. Let's not do amazing things. Let's do good. Is it good? Maybe today it just needs to be good enough. So little steps, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. That's another one of my things. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Do little things consistently, and you're going to make good progress. And I love being around people like this that are consistently making little steps because when you look at that over the course of five years, you might have come a long way. All right, let's talk about fodder trees. Um, who here, does anyone here know what fodder trees are? Yes, Nicole, we got a couple people. I've been talking to people. Um, we've been learning about fodder trees. Um, so I do ecosystem engineering is the easiest, simplest way I can explain this. I design an ecosystem to meet the needs of the climate. That's anywhere from a quarter of an acre, little suburban lot, postage stamp type situation, all the way up to big NGOs, big multinational corporations all over the US, outside the US, you know, thousands of acres, millions of dollars in earthworks and moving dirt. Um, down to just troubleshooting. Hey, my pasture is just kind of crap and I don't know what to do about it. Um, and in all of these designs, all of these systems that I help people troubleshoot or build from the ground up, um, the question is always, you know, how do I, how do I make this work if times are great? But what seldom happens is people seldom think, how do I make this work if times get tough? If things go sideways and a critical component of my whole system just isn't available. And I've designed everything around this one component that everything hinges on. I'm feeding my family. The most important thing is, are they fed? Because if they don't get fed, they die. Can we feed our family? That's why we prep. That's why we buy rice and beans or whatever. So we've got chickens, we've got rabbits, we've got goats, we've got sheep. And the whole idea is, I'm feeding my kids, I'm feeding my wife, I'm feeding my family. Maybe it's, I'm feeding my crew. If we can't feed them, we got big problems, right? So if everything is designed on, I'm going to the feed store and I'm picking up a ton of feed every month. What happens if that feed store doesn't have feed? What happens to all your animals? We have a cascading set of failures built into the system from the foundation. Because if you can't get that feed, you're screwed. So, we have animals, they eat plants. We can grow those plants. We're buying 12% protein feed, maybe 20% protein feed to feed our livestock, right? Most animals need around 16% protein. So what can we do to supplement that if times are good? Or if times get bad, could we potentially do this 
without these modern conveniences of pelletized feed. So I started looking into that and I found, of course, people have been doing that for thousands of years. It's only in the last really 100, 150 years that people forgot about it. There's an old, old technology, literally. We have historical documented proof of this that reaches back like 4,000 years, five, 6,000 years. This is old tech. Old tech is sometimes the best tech. All right, so people have been harvesting or using animals to harvest leaves from plants to make meat and make fat. And that's what we need. We need meat and fat. There's no essential carb, sorry. Um, these animals are autonomous drones. They're four-wheel drive, all-terrain. Man, they are working hard 24-7 to grow you protein and fat. And they love it, and they are happy to do it. They're the best employees ever. As long as you can be smarter than a goat. You know, they're really good employees. So, we wanna grow some leaves, so we can grow grass. Right, we got some grass. It's a pasture, everyone knows what pasture is, right? We see cows out there, sheep grazing on grass. One of the problems with that is, they don't only get so tall, and if they graze it down too much, they're getting down to a zone where, what did Nicole just say? Crap rolls downhill. Where all the crap is. That's where all the internal parasites are traveling up those grass stems and cycling through your animals, and they're getting sick and losing weight and skinny, emaciated animals don't make for good food. We can have good healthy pastures, but what if we add some some trees, right? We've got some trees, and they're growing branches for us, and they're casting shade. Shade, especially in the south, means we've got grass that's going to grow better. You ever observed you see a, a tree out in the middle of a pasture, and it's a dry part of the year, but there's kind of on the east side of that tree, there's kind of like a, a green little cloud. That's green grass and stuff growing, kind of on the east side of that. I'm like, oh, I wonder why that is. It's given a little bit of shade. You see these beautiful parks, we see these Beautiful, you know, it's grass underneath and trees dotting it, and the trees look gorgeous and healthy, and the stalk is gorgeous and healthy and sleek and fat. We got a nice pasture. Kind of that park setting, that's called a silva pasture. And I think there's something inherently in us that just connects to that. When we see it and we think, man, that's just gorgeous, that's that's right, that's good. And it just there's something deep, innate, maybe ancestral, ancestral memories or something that just really connects to us. That kind of system was used for thousands of years. They would go through and they would chop the branches off. And those branches would fall down and they'd hit the ground and those animals would eat those branches. This is called pollardy. And then they would say, hey, you know, we gotta cook. We gotta cook the meat and we need some some fuel wood and you know they didn't have chainsaws. So cutting down a hundred foot tree with a chainsaw and bucking it up into logs and using a hydraulic wood processor to split it all up. That, that was labor intensive. That was tons of calories that you had to, to to expend to cut that tree down and chop it up and split it. They didn't do that. They coppiced. They would grow a tree. We got a tree. We got a whole bunch of trees, and they grow up, and then they cut those trees off in the winter, and then in the spring. Let's get a different color here. In the spring, we would have a whole bunch of shoots come up. Right? I'm sure we've all seen this. We've all seen 
timber company come through and they cut a whole bunch of stuff down and they leave a whole bunch of stumps. And the next year you see them sprout up like this. Everyone seen crepe myrtle murder? See these crepe myrtle trees and they just butcher the tops of them? People get all upset about it. They're murdering the trees. No, they're pollarding the trees. That's old tech. Pollarded trees will sometimes live for a logarithmic scale that's like times 10 years longer than a tree left by itself. That doesn't sound like murder in a tree. That sounds like uh, What's the word you say? Pollard? Pollard. P-O-L-L-A-R-D. There's, there's two styles of management. We got pollarding and coppicing. Pollarding is cutting it off right here and you let these suck her out, right? So we got shoots coming out of these kind of knots that'll form. And they make beautiful trees. I mean, gorgeous. They look ugly in the winter because you got these, you know, kind of lumps and it'll stop. But then when it suckers out and it fills in, it's just gorgeous. And in the summertime, when you're looking up there, you think, man, that's the prettiest tree I've ever seen. And you drive past and unless you're observant, you won't notice, oh yeah, that's the tree I hate every winter because it looks ugly. They're pollarding it. So coppicing, all of this growth is first year growth. It's gonna be the most tender, the most succulent. It's gonna have the highest amount of sugar in it. It's gonna have the highest amount of protein in it. The inner bark on this will be edible to most of these herbivores. It's gonna have a ton of protein and sugar and good stuff for them, they're gonna love it. So we can go through and we can cut all of this stuff. We let this grow. Um, Every tree grows at a different rate, depends on sunlight and nutrition in the soil and how much water it gets. And just inherently, some of them grow faster. Hybrids normally grow faster. They grow faster and taller and quicker. Um, some trees grow really slow. Dogwoods grow really, really slow. They've got tight grain. You know, if you ever cut down a tree and it's really tight lines in that, that grain, it's a slow growing tree. It's really big, thick lines in between the, the white and the dark fast growing tree. So we want, for a system like this, we want fast growing trees because we want them to shoot up, make tons of biomass that we can harvest, feed to our animals, and turn into fuel wood, whatever. And, and so ideally, you know, if we're looking for optimal protein synthesis, we want to grow some hybrid trees. So things like Hybrid willow, hybrid poplar. Those are two of the fastest growing trees that I know of. Um, Polonia is another really fast growing tree. Um, but there could be some issues. I try to make this as dead simple as possible, as difficult to screw up as possible. So I say hybrid poplar, which is a cottonwood, and hybrid willow, it's just a willow species crossed with another willow species. They grow really fast. I don't know of any domestic animals that cannot eat both of those, okay? So they're pretty much dead simple. If you're managing them well, they're gonna produce tons of food for you, all right? And so we let that grow up. Um, we let it grow maybe for one, two, maybe three years before we start cutting it off to coppice it, uh, just like this. And then it'll send out a whole bunch of shoots and then we're gonna let those grow until early summer, maybe middle of summer. <clears throat> and then we're gonna cut them off at about 18 inches. And we're gonna take all this top stuff, right? We're gonna cut all this off. Some of them will grow a little bit better. And we're gonna put it all in a barrel, right? We can shred this up or if you want to dry it and make hay, tree hay, this is old, old tech. They would actually cut this stuff and they would tie it together in sheaves and they'd put it in the shade and dry it just like hay. And we have pictures from, gosh, I mean, we have pictures of people doing this in Europe. They're still doing it in Europe, okay? They'd harvest this and dry it and then feed it to their livestock just like we would do hay. We cut grass hay. We can cut tree hay. Or we can actually pre-digest this stuff by fermenting it. 
Everyone knows about fermenting. You know, we ferment pickles, we ferment uh, kimchi and sauerkraut. There's a whole bunch of traditional foods that are fermented. And that fermentation process breaks down the food and makes it easier to digest. So we get more food value per bite, right? And so if we're talking about raising livestock, what do we want? Do we want to waste time and money and effort? No, we want to get the most production as we can and have the healthiest animal. Because if we have healthy food, we're going to be healthier, right? So I think one of the best ways, and I'm into preparedness. I want to make sure that I can handle the things that life throws at me. So I want to be able to store this food. And if we ferment it with a silage making process, you know, we've got like a two year shelf life on this stuff. And on top of that, we get higher protein. So if we're looking at normal animal feed and we're looking at maybe 12 to 16%, right? That's the target for most, you know, commercial feed. If we're growing things like the best, the best I know of so far is white mulberry, but it grows a little bit slower than the hybrids. So I like to have all three so I can have some short term, subpar, good fodder with the hybrids. They get up and grown really fast. They're dead simple to propagate. You can get a couple of them and turn them into a hundred in a year or two. They're super simple. I mean, I mean, it's so stupid simple. You take a cutting in the winter. Like if, if we had some cottonwood trees out here, we could go take some cuttings out off of that tree right now, stick them in the ground, and John would have more trees when everything starts leafing out. They would just grow new trees. You can do that with willow and cottonwood. I'm not, I'm not hiding any, any part of it. I don't, you have, don't have to have some magical rooting hormone. You literally just take a cutting and stick it in the ground. Now John was like, you're not gonna tell him about this because you sell all this stuff, right? Nope. I give away all this information for free. Yep, I sell the trees. I care more about y'all getting resiliency built into your lives than I care about me making money. That's not exactly how that went. <laughs> <laughs> so, 12 to six, well, listen, if I help tons of people, I'm building community. And that's, that's really beneficial to me. 12 to 16% with our commercial feed. The willow is normally around 16 to 18%. The, the cottonwood, the hyper poplar, around eight on the low side to maybe 14-ish percent. White mulberry. Unless you're taking these leaves at the end of summer, like fall, when they're just, they're sucking all the sugars out and protein out, putting them in the roots to survive the winter. If we're taking them in the springtime, we're looking at twenty-eight to thirty-four percent protein. Now the reason being is they have been selectively breeding white mulberry for the silk trade for thousands of years. And when you've got these insects eating these leaves, when you got a patch of white mulberry that just doesn't grow very much silk, well, you chop that down and replace it with trees that have grown better silk. And so they've been selecting for thousands of years, high protein, high digestible, um, food value, white mulberry leaves. And so we have naturally selected fantastic feed value in the white mulberry. Lots of people talk about it being invasive. It's like, oh, it's so invasive. It's not native. Man, every single plant is native to this plant. I don't care about invasives. You salads the woody parts and all? What? You salads the woody parts and all? Yes. So all this is going to be pretty dang supple and, and tender. Most leaf shredders, not even wood chippers, 
Most leaf shredders can handle this stuff. They just get a bag of course. Yep. You can, uh, they, they make these like clip where you clip the bag onto it and you can just run the, the sticks down in there and they'll just shred them and it shreds directly into a, like a contractor bag, you know, that thicker heavy mill plastic in a 55 gallon drum. It shreds it in there. You put about 12 to 18 inches in there. You got a five gallon bucket set off to the side. You want a little bit extra sugar so that uh, lactobacillus will convert it into acetic acid, vinegar, right? We're pickling this stuff. And so we'll get one kilogram ballpark, two and a quarter pounds of molasses. Just weigh out two and a quarter pounds of molasses into a bucket, pour some hot water in there, mix it around, dissolve it, and you've got a dissolved molasses slurry. Um, that's gonna go into this whole barrel. So you put up about 12, 18 inches of the shredded leaves in there, sprinkle some of the molasses water on top, smash it down, pound it. We want to get all the air out. We want to smash that stuff in as tight as we can. We want as little air and as much plant matter as we can. Smash it down, put some more in. Smash it down, put some more in. Keep doing that until you fill it all the way up. Get yourself a shop vac and close that bag up. Stick a shop vac right on it and suck all the air out. Pull it down, spin it tight, tape it up, slap a lid on it, put the date that you closed it up month and a half, normally it takes at least a month and a half, depends on temperature. I say give it two months. Give it two months before you try and pull anything out of there. Or if you don't need it, leave it sit. It can sit in there for a couple of years. You've got a couple of years shelf life of high protein feed. Now I'm not saying during the winter time you feed this straight to your animals. You need to cut this. There, this is concentrated feed. This is like buying soybean meat. Like this is protein levels that you get out of soybean meat. You would not just feed, you know, five pounds of this per animal. They get a little bit and, you know, met, monitor the body condition, but they're eating two to 6% protein hay or forage that they're just finding out in your, your pasture. And then they're getting a little bit of this. With this kind of system, we can be taking small, fresh leaf harvest and some, some dried storage material and feeding rabbits. We can grow rabbits for free with just our time and a little bit of effort. Rabbits, a uh, breeding pair of rabbits, a uh, breeding trio of rabbits can put out, I think it's somewhere around four or 500 pounds of meat with an intensive uh, breeding cycle. That's a lot of meat for two females. Okay, if we're feeding dogs, rabbits, and a little bit of chicken, that goes a long way towards feeding a 24-7 security detail. I like having a security detail, constantly monitoring and protecting my flock, my poultry, my kids, my wife, if I'm gone, I've got a security detail watching over my kids and my wife all night long. Takes a little bit of food. So if we set something up like this, that means if, if times get tough, we can feed our critters. If times don't get tough, how much work is this? Do I have to do this? Do I have to keep doing this? If I'm busy with work or whatever? Nope, absolutely not. You know how easy this compass system is to manage? John's gonna be planning, how many did you buy? Uh, 350, 400. Okay, he's gonna be planting hundreds of trees right up here. I'm planting about 2,000. I'm planting, I think it's 1,800 to start with, it might be more. Uh, on a quarter of an acre. 1,800 on a quarter acre? Yep. This far apart. Yep, about six inches apart. I've got I've got figures, I can't remember what they are off the top of my head on um, how many tons per acre that we can pull off of digestible protein. I've got all that stuff. If you're interested, I can, I can email you. You can go to Feedopedia, 
and, and they have like tabs at the top. If you go to Feedopedia and look at white mulberry, there's tabs at the top. Like the second tab over is like nutritional info or something like that. Um, and they've got tons of white papers and studies, like institutional uh, studies that have been done on this. Really detailed information. If you want to get geeky about it and understand kind of what we're talking about, there's tons of free information on this. Um, my website, I've got lots of stuff already linked on these plants. Rareplantstore.com. You can see the types of trees I recommend. I don't care if you buy them from me. I sell out every year in like a week. I don't care if you buy them from me. In fact, I tell people, you know, a lot of people in this homesteading sphere, they're doing things on a shoestring budget. And I feel it, because I've been there. Some of this stuff is growing where you live. Learn to identify willow and cottonwood. You, I mean, anything in the populous genus is pretty much gonna be close to the same thing. Any, almost anything in the, in the salix genus, the salix, the willow genus, those are probably gonna be pretty dang close. They're not gonna produce as well, maybe not high in protein. You probably have white mulberry growing somewhere in your region. If you learn how to take cuttings off of those and root those under a mist, a mist system is really simple to set up. Free, free detailed instructions on how to do that on YouTube. You can take cuttings off of those in the springtime, late spring, early summer, and stick them under a mist system and grow hundreds of those white mulberry from something you find at a local park, okay? So you can do this for free. Or you can wait till next winter when I actually have stock and, and you could get stuff that you know for sure. Like that's one of the only good reasons to buy it directly from someone is you know for sure. If you don't know how to identify this stuff, you can buy it and you know positively. And then you say, oh yeah, I've got two of those right over there. And after they leaf out. Do you have problems with rats getting into the contractor bags? No, because it's inside a 55 gallon drum. Oh, okay. I missed that part. Yep, it's inside a drum. And then we just use the, the plastic bag to keep the air out of it. Will rats and squirrels want to get into it? Not really. Um, I, I've heard of it very rarely, but I think it's more of they just, there's something there to chew on, so they start chewing on it to investigate. They're curious and they, they, they're looking for food. Um, it, it doesn't stink. It smells sweet. And your animals go nuts over it. Um, so it increases the digestibility and it, it'll actually break down some of the lignin and cellulose, the fiber that make it difficult for non-herbivores to eat this stuff, chickens and ducks. So you can actually bump up the amount of this that chickens and ducks will eat um, by fermenting it like this. How much time? 10 minutes. 10, cool. What about deer pressure on, uh, on your area? Dogs. Very good question. So I partner with my dogs. My dogs are integral to a good, efficient system. Dogs are on task all the time. Donkeys kill things if the thing comes after them. Um, llamas, the same thing, they're just kind of dicks. Geese, they're just kind of dicks. Um, dogs, depending on what livestock guardian dog or what type of dog you have, some of them, they'll just kind of bow up and they'll kind of threaten the threat and, and say, hey, hey, you better, you better back off or I'm gonna tangle with you and you don't want that to happen. And they'll just stand there at that fence and just bark and bark and bark, right? I don't like that. Um, that's typically more of the Pyrenees style of doing things. I like Pyrenees, don't get me wrong. Um, I like the Anatolian because they're more aggressive and they'll just go out there and end a threat. But I like the livestock guardian dogs. They'll kind of just, they see the threat and they'll just kind of melt back behind the tree and they'll just stand there and wait. Come on, buddy. <laughs> and it hops over the fence and it gets about 10 yards in. And then two livestock guardian dogs from different sides, pincher and they end the thread. I like that. Because then I, I'm like, all right, 
That guy's not coming back next week. That threat's over. Right. Um, then, I, then I have a, a, a dead critter that's going in my black soldier fly bin. The black soldier flies are turning that into high quality protein and fat for my chickens and ducks. And then uh, I get to take what's left and put in the compost heap that, that I don't turn. You can ask me about not ever turning compost again. I hate turning compost. Um, I will never turn a compost pile again in my life. Um, and then we can uh, kind of recycle all of that back in. But as far as deer pressure, this is high, high sugar, high protein stuff. They love it. Um, if you do not have dogs, then what you need are electric bees. Anyone have electric bees? Nicole has, oh yeah, Ken. We have some people with electric bees. You want a fence energizer that plugs in to the AC, not one of the solar things. The solar ones are always very low power. I've never seen one with a good amount of zap. You want at least three joules being delivered through that line. If you can get six or eight, that's much better. You want eight joules of electricity will arc out about that far and will jump out and bite you. Um, little quick story, my brother, um, I won't say which one in case he sees this video. Um, he saw, you know, a little lightning bolt popping out of my electric fence. And he was like, hey, I'm gonna play with that. And it just rained and there was a little bit of debris on the insulator and it was popping from the wire to a little bit of wet leaf or something. And it's a little lightning bolt. So he picked up a dry leaf and he's crouched down on the balls of his feet, not the most stable of footing. And he's manipulating this, uh, this lightning bolt, making it jump this way and that. It's all fun. And it's up here. And then he loses his balance and leans forward. And no, it was this, this knee. And he grabs the metal T-post underneath the little lightning bolt and it goes through this arm, across his chest, and down that knee, and his whole chest went <gasps> like this. He said his vision dimmed down to about this big, and then he came to, and he decided he wasn't ever going to touch that again. <laughs> and, and I use that as an illustration. Um, if you have enough of a bite on that fence, any sane creature is gonna decide, you know what, what's on the other side of that is just not worth it. Um, we can understand intellectually, that's not gonna hurt me. But I challenge you, even if you know that's not gonna damage me, just walk through it anyways and just get zapped. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> it is tough to psychologically just force yourself to experience that and undergo that. It's really tough. It's even tougher for an animal who can't, you know, think about this stuff and reason through it. It's even tougher for them. So get, get a fence energizer that has enough bite to convince any critter that you don't want to be in there, four-legged or two-legged, that it's not worth what's on the other side and that, that problem will go mostly away. Um, canines love peanut butter and bacon grease. You can take, unplug your fence of course first. You can take aluminum foil, fold it into kind of like a flag, wrap it over that, and then smear some peanut butter on it or bacon grease, and you put it at the nose height of whatever critter you're trying to deter, and they're gonna come along, scouting around, they're gonna smell that, and they're gonna go up with their wet nose or their tongue, and they're gonna lick that thing, and those electric bees will just materialize from out of nowhere and kick their rear end, and they're gonna run away in terror at the electric bees that live here. And whatever that is, it's not gonna be worth it, okay? It can be deer, peanut butter, applesauce. You can take applesauce and kind of render, not render it down, uh, reduce it down, cook it a little bit just to get a little bit stickier. You can smear applesauce on it. 
They actually sell aluminum bait cups with a little scent, a little felt scent pad, and you can drip a little bit of scent pad in there. Like and, peanut butter too. So. Yep, peanut butter, yeah. And so you can do stuff like that and, and hang that on your fence. And what I would do if I was deterring deer, I like to go about 12 feet, give or take, from the things that you're trying to keep them away from and hang those scent cups every 12 to 20 feet. And then they'll come in and normally deer will travel in, in little groups. And if one gets zapped by electric bees and jumps up 10 feet and runs the opposite direction, the others aren't gonna wait around to wonder, huh, oh, wonder what happened to Bob. <laughs> They're gonna say, the oh, crap, Bob's running from something. We need to run away. And they're going to learn that this place is not safe to be. They're going to start avoiding that. If that happens a couple times with that same herd of deer, they're going to start changing their patterns and they're gonna go around that dangerous area. And so they'll just they'll just leave their stuff alone. Any other questions? Where are you leaving the barrels? Out in the sun or covered, shaded? With any food storage, cool and out of the sun. Doesn't matter if it's food for us or food for animals. I keep it cool and out of sun. Keep it under shade. Which website again? Um, I've got a couple websites. So the plant website is rareplantstore.com. And then my main website that you can get a hold of me for consulting or um, I did a podcast for like a year. Um, my podcast episodes are still up there. Um, and that is homegrownliberty.com. Umbrella Liberty and Rare Plant Store. On your collar trees, the one that you've done, have you ever experienced any difference between how many main limbs you allow to be on the tree? I know they recommend like three to five, but have you been able to experiment with that and find any sweet spots? Very good question. Um, how many how many scaffold limbs do we want on a pollarded tree? So generally the pollarded trees will be about, um, you want to set them just above browse height. So if you're in the African savanna, that browse height might be um, about, about up there. Um, if we're not in the African savanna and we just have pygmy goats, your browse height might be here, right? So you have to think about your context. Where are you? What kind of creatures are browsing? If it's my goats, it needs to be above my goats browse height. If it's deer, I need to set it about here because they'll stand up and they'll reach up as high as they can. If it's cattle, you know, we might need to set it up here. Generally, it's about six foot, it's about head height. Um, and generally, four-ish limbs is good, six is fine. Um, once you start getting more than that, you start kind of crowding. Um, if you have, you know, three, four main scaffold limbs and then some some secondary scaffold limbs coming out, that's fine. Um, it really just all depends on your context, how big the trunk gets. The bigger that trunk gets, the more limbs I'm gonna allow off because I'm gonna be able to branch out uh, um, further and further and capture more sunlight and capture more, more um, water. Yeah, man, I'm talking about Willis, one of the realest.